morning and happy Sabbath. As far as possible, will you kneel with us as we start our worship hour? Let's all stand and sing our call to worship. Father and our God, once again, we are grateful to you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your protection that you gave us this past week. And as we worship you today, we pray that the Holy Spirit may be here, may be in our minds, in our hearts. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see so many of you here, even though it's a little bit cold outside, the air is a little cold. But imagine, we have friends in Hawaii that are complaining because it's 60 degrees. And they're dressing like you guys are, so I'm thankful that, uh, that we have uh, the Sabbath day that we can all come apart and uh, join and have worship together. Let's start our worship in singing hymn number 294, Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Are in the blood, come for 
that we'd like to sing for our worship time is Shine, Jesus, Shine. story shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory place spirit place set our Now it's time for our family song. Now we've been doing this for a few weeks and we're still a little scratchy on this one. So what we need to do is we're going to sing it one time through, all of us. Stay where you're at the first time through. Once we finish it the first time through, then we're going to have you greet each other, you know, give each other a hug or a handshake. And then when we start singing it the second time, make your way back to, to the pew so we can do our opening song.
better than family, especially with the family of God. We will now sing our opening song, hymn number 516, 516, all the way. outside <laughs> but it's warm in here we're so happy that you chose to come and worship with us this morning we'd like to take this time to welcome you here to our church to worship God and uh, also like to acknowledge our internet audience who is watching via the internet we we want to welcome you as well um, I want to say that uh, right after the service we do have something special for all of you and that is we have our monthly fellowship meal. And so make plans to stay and enjoy the fellowship and enjoy the food right after this service. We want to remind you that we have um, an appointment every week here in our church. We'd like to encourage you to come out and uh, enjoy the blessing of God by coming to prayer meeting. And that is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we need to pray in a special way for all these individuals that you see on the screen. They have needs, they have uh, different things that we need to pray for them in a special way. And um, we want to um, recognize, I just was given a card and I uh, would like to acknowledge our, our guests this morning. And uh, we have Sarah and Mike Wolf. Where are you? Sarah and Mike Wolf, right there. Okay, God bless you. All right. Keep your hand up. We have something coming to you. All right. Do we have anyone else, uh, a guest this morning? 
who is with us. Okay? Right there. Okay? Excellent. Um, we also have, of course, our guest speaker, and uh, Wally and his wife, who is here. Jacqueline, is that the name? Okay. So keep your, put your hand up, and I will give you, um, we'll give you something as well. Anyone else who's a guest this morning? And we have our guest speaker as well. All right. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much. Um, for our upcoming events, we have um, a couple of things. One is we have the sign language class that meets every Thursday at, at 645. Uh, they meet in the library. And uh, today we have a special speaker, and uh, that is Wally Carson, who is going to share with us the Word of God. And, um, and then we'll have the fellowship meal. And right after that, we are going to have uh, an afternoon session. Um, if, you, um, if you have some questions about religious liberty, if you have some, uh, some questions about what is happening in our country today as it relates to religious liberty, uh, he's going to be covering that this afternoon. Okay. Um, last week I mentioned that um, we are getting ready to have a, um, a Daniel seminar here in our church. And the reason why I mention that is because, number one, I want you all to make this a matter of prayer. And not only that, but begin thinking, and not only begin thinking, but begin, begin praying for people um, to, uh, for you to invite those people to come to, to this uh, special seminar. And it's going to be two days a week, okay? Two days a week is going to be Saturday evening and also Sunday evening. All right, and for all the guests who come, we are going to provide a supper for um, for them, and it's going to be wonderful because we are going to encourage participation, involvement. Uh, we're going to have a a uh, table facilitator at each table that is going to help in that, and so this is going to happen in the month of May. All right, so I want you all to please make this a matter of prayer because. The only one that can bring conviction to the hearts is God himself. And so we need to uh, make this a, a matter of prayer. Now, um, at the beginning of the year, we, we had an ordination service for um, our deacons and our deaconesses and also our elders, those who were not ordained. But at that time, we had, um, we had several that were, not, um, that were not able to be here for that occasion. And so uh, this morning... We have a couple of deacons that are going to be ordained, and I'd like to invite Tom Wagner and also Gregorio Perez to come to the front. And um, as they make their way to the front, we also like to invite all the elders who are here and, um, and also our head deacon to come up as we are going to um, pray in a special way for them. We're going we're gonna to kneel together, and um, we're going to pray in a special way for our two brothers here. Our Father and our God, you make the call to everyone to serve. Today, Lord, we pray in a special way for Tom and for Gregorio that you may place your hand upon them as they prepare to serve you as deacons of this church. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill them, to help them, to inspire them, and to make them aware that this is your call that you're giving to them. And so, Father, we pray, release your Holy Spirit upon them. Bless them and their families. Help them to be examples in their families in their neighborhoods, at their work, wherever they be, may be, Lord, we pray that you be with them. And Father, as they perform the duties of, of the deacons in this church, we pray that you may help them 
to do it according to your will. Thank you, Lord, for your call in their life. And as we place our hands upon them, signifying that they are set apart to do this work, ordained by you, we pray in a special way for them. So, Father, bless in a special way Brother Tom and Brother Gregorio. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have um, a couple of things that we want to give you. Um, this is for you, Gregorio and Tom. Okay. God bless you. And uh, we also have this for Tom. Okay. God bless you. We're excited that in our church, we have the ministry of our school. And um, every month, the first Sabbath of the month, we have this uh, feature that we call the TLC Minute. And I'd like to invite the person in charge of talking to us about TLC to come up at this time. Janet is uh, speaking at the Spanish church today. So uh, we'd like to invite you in the next couple of weeks, we'll be having it, uh, have a uh, couple of students up here, but we are having our open house the last Sunday of this month, and we'd like to invite anybody that would like to come and see the school and find out more about it to come on February 26th, I believe it is, um, on Sunday. From 4 to 7, is that right, Ann? From 4 to 7. We'll be giving you more information as the month goes on. Thank you. We we'll ask the young lambs to come forward as they collect the the offering for our school. Just before the children's story that will be told by Sister Nelda Hager. Our little lambs. Take all that loose change and heavy dollar bills that's weighing your wallet and your pockets down and drop them on in them in the little baskets there and they'll do good. <laughs>
I mean, you can since you like it, but don't go far with it. I need it, okay? <coughs> Y'all is so nice around here. It's a nice church you have here. Thank you. Okay. May I sit in it? All right. Um, ah, Y'all have a beautiful church here. and Y'all folks are so nice. Are you the church spokesman? Yeah. Okay. Recruiting people. Okay. Yeah, uh, y'all, y'all are so nice around here. You treat me like you know me. I, I, I didn't think you knew me, but y'all are, everybody's walking up to me, calling me some name I've never heard of. Nel, Nelda. <laughs> Who is that? My name is Isabella. Isabella. Again, thank you so for inviting me to your church. It, I wrote everything down so that I can remember. I don't want to. I want to tell y'all about myself, and I don't want to miss anything. So I wrote it down. Is that all right? That's okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, my name is Isabella, and I was born in uh, 1797 on a farm in Swartkill, New York. Swartkill, New York. Okay. Okay. Well, my full name is Isabella Bumfrey, and I was born a slave. I had at least 10 brothers and sisters, but I didn't get to know them all. No. Well, see, I didn't get to know them all. <laughs> and so I, I might have forgotten a lot of their names. So, Slave owners would sell children just like property, you know. I'm going to talk to you because you're so interested. One day I would be playing with a brother or sister in the yard, and the next day they'd be gone. Don't you know? Well, I'm going to take these gloves off. Well, when I turned nine, it was my turn to be sold to a farmer named John Neely. I had grown up in a Dutch settlement and only knew how to speak Dutch. Well, Mr. Neely was an Englishman, and he was not happy that I could not speak English. So he beat me often because I wouldn't follow orders. The truth is, I, I didn't understand him. But anyway, I learned English just by listening to others talk, and I learned quick, because I didn't like getting beat. Life as a slave was very hard. I had to work constantly and was sold several times. My fourth and final owner was Mr. John Dumont. He was somewhat nicer to me than the rest of them, and I stayed with Mr. Dumont for many years. When I became a woman, I fell in love. <laughs> I fell in love with a man named Robert from a nearby farm. Well, Mr. Dumont wouldn't let me marry Robert. He ordered me to marry one of his own slaves named Thomas. This way, my children would become, belong to him. But I had five children. One died shortly after birth. I constantly worried about my children. I worried that one of my children might be taken away from me and sold, be sold. Well, around 1825, Mr. Dumont 
told me that he was going to set me free. <sighs> he told me it was going to be a year before he set me free just because I was a good worker. I was so happy. But the reality was that Mr. Dumont had to set me free because in New York, all the slaves were to be free in 1827. So he really wasn't doing me a favor. Well, when the year was up, he changed his mind, though. He said that I had to work for another year. I was so angry. I decided to escape. After I finished up my work, I walked right off that farm, and I went to stay with some nearby neighbors, the Van Wagoners, who thought that slavery was evil. When Mr. Dumont found out, he confronted the Van Wagoners, who agreed to purchase me for $20. And then they set me free. I was so happy. <sighs> but I wasn't happy for long. You see, although I was free, my children were not. Soon, though, I found out that my worst nightmare had come true. My son, Peter, had been sold to a slave owner in Alabama. And at that time in New York, it was illegal to sell slave or slaves across state lines. Well, I decided to go to court. I went to court. I won the court case, and Peter was returned to New York. People were amazed at my courage. It was very rare that that time for either a slave or a woman to take a white man to court. I not only went to court, but I won. Well, that's when I began to work for abolitionists. Do you know what an abolitionist is? No. Anybody got a guess? I like it in New York. I think people who help slaves escape. Exactly. What's your name? Danielle. Danielle, that's exactly right. An abolitionist is someone to work to set slave, slaves free. So I began to work all throughout the United States. I also believed in women's rights and basic civil rights for all people. I traveled the country telling people what it was like to be a slave. They say I was an excellent speaker. And when I told my story and explained how slaves were treated, people were moved. Young man, young man, what's your name again? Can I have my cane back? It's distracting me. All right, so they said I was an excellent speaker. What do you think? Am I an excellent speaker? Yes. Okay. So I met a lot of famous people while I was traveling and speaking. I met a very important man. His name was Abraham Lincoln. Yes, I did. I met him, and I met Susan B. Anthony. Yes, and I met Frederick Douglass. Yes, and I... I met I, Harriet, I don't remember her. I met um, Harriet Beecher Stowe there, though. I met her. And I met a friend of yours. Her name was Ellen White. I met a lot of her and her Millerite friends. I did. She's a nice woman. So let me ask you, what do you think slavery is like? Hard. Well, slavery is like playing with your friends and everyone is treating one friend badly. Okay. Slavery is like your master getting to have all the fun he wants. Okay. Well, I think slavery is like playing with your friends and everyone is treating just one friend badly just for no reason calling them names and making them do what no one else wants to do. Is that okay? No. I didn't think so. I used to say this a lot, and people liked it when I said it. I'd say, actually, I said this 
when I went to speak at my friend Ellen White's Sabbath, Sabbath School Convention in 19... Okay. Okay. So I went to a convention in 1863, and I said, children, children, who made your skin white? Was it not God? Who made mine black? Was it not the same God? And I, am I to blame, therefore, because my skin is black? Does not God love colored children as well as white children? And did not the same Savior die to save one as well as the other? Yes. Yes. I said that up and down the way when I went and spoke to all the people up and down New York and all over Maryland. I went as far as Canada to speak sometime. Yes. Remember when I told you my name was Isabella? Remember I told you my name was Isabella? Well, my name was Isabella. But when I left the house of bondage, I left everything behind. I wasn't going to keep going, going back to Egypt on me. And so I went to the Lord and asked him to give me a new name. And the Lord gave me Sojourner because I was to travel up and down the land, showing the people their sins and being a sign unto them. Afterwards, I told the Lord I wanted another name because everybody else has two names and the Lord gave me truth because I was to declare the truth to people and I always say truth is powerful and it never fails thank you for having me thank you so much ah. Okay, so anybody like to pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for each, for letting us come to church and please let us to be good and nice. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father. We have a wonderful day here. Amen. Amen. All right, you may go back to your seat. you love a good children's story. I want to just crawl down there and sit on the floor myself. Will the deacons come forward and as we prepare to lift our morning's tithe and offering. Lord, we do thank you for an opportunity to return a faithful tithe and an honest offering. We ask that you would bless those who uh, were faithful and in returning and giving and bless those of us, Father, who need to learn how to do more. We thank you. Now bless these gifts that they may hasten your soon coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold, I stand at the devil. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, said the Lord of hosts. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come in his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom ye delight in. Behold, he will come 
said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he shall be like a refined as fire and a full of soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them with gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in the former years. <clears throat> For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But she say, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But she say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithe and in offering. Ye are cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tide into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. If I would not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there would not be room enough to receive it. And I will bless the devour for your sake, said the Lord of hosts. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to burn and to be faithful to you. Bless our offerings and our efforts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Always a favorite time, um, the God of prayer. If you have special prayers that you want to petition the throne this morning. I like where we do it at prayer meeting. If you have a praise that you want to give this morning, sometimes you don't always have to be asking God for something. Sometimes you just want to say, thank you, Lord, for being so good to me. So if you have a prayer, a praise, or if you want to bring a burden to the Lord, if you're praying for somebody this morning, praying for a family member, praying for a miracle, now it's the time. I always say God answers more prayers on Sabbath than any other time. So bring your petition this morning as we go to the throne of grace. so thankful for another opportunity to call you Father. We're thankful so, so much for the freedom once again to come in your house this morning and make our petitions known, to hear beautiful music sing, to hear prayers and songs sung, Father. Freedom to hear the word speak, Father. And, Lord, as we look at this old world, this won't happen too much longer. 
But Lord, we pause to say thank you that we still have this freedom. We thank you so much for our speaker, Father, that is going to make a lot of these things clear today. We beg you to touch him, Father. Hide him behind the cross, Father. Dip him deeply into your Holy Spirit this morning. Let us hear and, Father, be aware of the state in which we live right now. We pause to say thank you for all your mercies, for all your blessings, Father. You've been so good to us. And we just say, Lord, thank you for every mercy, every blessing, every miracle. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you that we can breathe, we can walk, we can talk. Thank you for a cobble that's filled with food, Father. Thank you for clothes to put on our back, shoes on our feet. Lord, thank you for families, Father. Families that we can call families. Lord, there's so many folk who don't have a family, don't have a home, don't have a job. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for being so faithful to us. We have not been that way to you. And, Lord, we bring special petition to your throne this morning. We have a lot of requests, Father. We pause just for a second so that they may call out the requests and the problems, Father, this morning, just for a second, a few minutes. Lord, we cry out for our first elder this morning and his mother and his family. We pray that your will be done. We talked about it in Sabbath school this morning. We know you are able to do anything you so choose to do. So, Lord, we beg for mercy and grace on Ella Johnson and his mother. We know what you are capable of doing. We pray for your will to be done. We pray for all of our sick and afflicted father on our prayer list. We thank you so much for those that you have touched and healed and and who are still in the healing process. We pray for Elder uh, Johnny this morning, Father, that you continue to be with him. And all the rest of those, Father, who, who are on our, our sick list who are not here today. Lord, we pray for families, Father. We, we pray for marriages, Father. We know you are the glue that holds marriages together. And we beg you, Father, to keep our marriages together. Lord, keep our families together. Lord, we pray for every young person kneeled here today. The devil seeks to destroy our young people, Lord. We pray that you put a hedge about them as you did with Job and protect them and keep them, especially our grown children, Father, who feel now that they know everything. And many of them have gone away from, from our home and they moved away, Father, spreading their wings. We beg you to protect them in this foolish time that they're going through. We all went there, Father. We've all been there. So we beg you to protect them. Bring them back home because you promised. And when all is said and done, Lord, we beg you for a place in your kingdom this morning. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Daniel 6, verses 8 through 10. Daniel chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and per Persians, which altereth not. <laughs> therefore, King, therefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. 
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his window being open in his, in his chamber toward Jerusalem and knelt on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks unto the Lord as he did before time. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. I have this morning the distinct pleasure in introducing our uh, speaker this morning. Um, I had the um, distinct pleasure of um, a meeting with uh, uh, Wally Carson when I was part of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee for Potomac Conference. As we were putting together this new Constitution, oftentimes we would come to a point where we needed legal counsel. And so we would call on uh, Wally Carson to, to make the difficult plain and to, to guide us through uh, in writing this Constitution. It was key to our success, so I, I am um, grateful to have him here as our speaker today. So I want to tell you a little bit about him and uh, who he is and what he's done. He is a servant of God and definitely a servant of the Adventist church uh, because he has spent his career serving uh, the community. Uh, Walter Carson is a 1965 graduate of CUC where he received a bachelor's degree in history. Uh, he attained his law degree from Catholic University in Washington, D.C. in 1968. There, um, uh, Carson's uh, professional experience includes public service as an assistant law director for the city of Cleveland, Ohio, and assistant attorney general for the state of Ohio. He also served as a congressional liaison for the U.S. Postal Service, representing that organization legislative program on Capitol Hill. In 2006, Carson was elected to serve the Columbia Union Conference Seventh-day Adventist as the vice president and general counsel. In that capacity, he provides general corporate legal counsel to church leadership. His responsibilities include public affairs and religious liberties, assisting church members who seek Sabbath accommodations in the workplace, trust services, addressing state planning and interests of church members, and the Columbia Union Revolving Fund, which we call the CURF. Prior to joining the Columbia Union, Carson worked in the General Conference Office of General Counsel, General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. His duties there included intellectual property and general corporate matters. He also served as a parliamentary um, to a number of organizations, the rules and regulations of how we, how we govern. Carson has also appeared in state and federal courts as an advocate for religious freedoms and the separation of church and state. He successfully argued a case before the U.S. Supreme Court in Hobby versus Florida Bureau of Unemployment and Compensation. He's the member of the Maryland State Bar Association and the American Bar Association and is credentialed parliamentarian with the, United, with the National Association of Parliamentarians. Carson and his wife, Jacqueline Carson, live in Woodbine, Howard County, Maryland. Very ex extensive background in serving people and serving the church. It is an honor and a privilege to have him here with us, especially during this time where the, the, the nation is struggling with religious freedom. So his timing is perfect. Uh, should I say the Lord's timing is perfect to have him here. Uh, after we have um, a song by our brother, David Slater, we'll hear the words of our friend and confidant, Wally Carson.
Garrett Slater, thank you so much for your music. We got a president once upon a time by the name of Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton played a saxophone, perhaps not as well as David Slater. I like to see your seat. <laughs> but Bill Clinton signed into law uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was, uh, and still is, a very important law that uh, protects uh, individuals who are seeking to uh, exercise their religious beliefs and when those beliefs come in conflict with uh, federal or state law, uh, the uh, law that was signed by President Bill Clinton is there to provide relief and help. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, what an exciting day. What a wonderful day to be in church. Sunny day outside, cold. So it's nice to be inside where it's warm, temperatures are warm, uh, but I also feel the warmth of your hearts. And uh, my wife Jackie and I are uh, delighted to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I can hardly wait to uh, go back home and uh, share with my friends that this morning I was in the presence of Sojourner Truth. <laughs> Delightful lady, well informed. Uh, so. I found uh, that to be inspirational as well. Uh, we're celebrating uh, religious freedom today. Uh, our church is one of the leaders uh, in this country in celebrating religious freedom. We put out a magazine called Liberty Magazine. And some of you may be familiar with Liberty Magazine. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful publication. It costs only $6. I know $6 may be a lot in some homes, but when you support Liberty Magazine, you take this journal and place it in the hands of thought leaders around the country. I've been in congressional offices. I've seen the magazine there on the uh, congressman's desk. I've been in the federal courts in Washington, D.C., and I've seen it on the justices' desks. I've been in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where we're constantly at war with people who are trying to take away Sabbath rights, and we're, we're seeking Sabbath accommodations before the EEOC, and I've seen Liberty Magazine. So it gives our church, and it gives individuals like yourselves a voice in these uh, variety of different uh, important places uh, throughout our country. But the most important place for Liberty Magazine, really, uh, is uh, on your own table stand uh, at home. Because it keeps you aware of what's happening. Uh, it informs you on the issues of the day. Uh, and it lets you know what's happening and where we stand uh, as we uh, journey uh, along that uh, prophetic timetable. Uh, I bring you greetings from the uh, Columbia Union. Dave Wigley and the, the leadership team there. I also uh, am delighted that my wife was able to join me this morning, Jackie. Uh, Appreciate it very much. Uh, Bill Jones's uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, always interesting when uh, the, the, uh, those on the podium uh, get up and leave when it's your turn to speak. Uh, what do they know and where are they going? <laughs> so, so, uh, he was probably in his early 80s. It had likely been some 60 years before he was taken from his home and his parents and everything that he knew so well. He had been raised up as a faithful believer in his God. He had survived the fall of one kingdom and now had a prominent and important role in another kingdom. He spoke the language with a slight accent. We don't know that he had any family to speak of, but he was bright, he was capable, and he was respected by all who knew him. Daniel 
in the land of the Medes and Persians held an important role. The new king, Darius, had divided his kingdom into 120 districts. He had set up a leader in each of those districts, and then he had appointed three governors who were to be responsible for the work, for the peace and quiet, and for the monetary things that took place in each of these districts. And over these satraps, as they were called, these three governors had a great deal of, to say. It was politics as usual, not, not terribly different from what goes on here at the national level here in the United States of America. There were also jealousies. And the governors and the heads of these 120 districts resented Daniel. They resented him because he was a man of integrity. He was a man who believed and worshipped his God. And when Darius made plans to elevate Daniel to the second in command of this kingdom, well, you can imagine what happened. The 120 from around the districts, the other two governors, they got together periodically and they talked about this so-and-so Jew, this refugee. How is it that the king confides in him? How is it that the king is willing to place him at the head of this great kingdom? We've got to get rid of this guy. He doesn't laugh at our jokes. He doesn't play in the office Super Bowl uh, 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 contest. He's too much of a straight arrow. We know that he's not a corrupt person. We know that he does not cheat or lie or steal. But the one flaw that we may be able to trip him up on is the fact of he is a deeply religious person. That is what we will use to take advantage of this man. And so they conspired. They made their plans uh, in secret. Daniel was not informed. He did not know what was going on. They asked for a private audience with the king, with Darius. And the word in the Bible that we read, which I think is so fascinating, is that they, in verse 6 of chapter 6 of Daniel, these governors and these satraps thronged wronged, if you will, before the king. And they took advantage of the king's ego. And they suggested to the king, why don't you enter a decree? And the decree will provide that no one may worship or bow down to any being for the next 30 days. Only you, king, only you are worthy of such devotion. The king who happened to respect and admire Daniel, who was ready to promote Daniel to be his second in command, let his ego take advantage of him, and he signed the decree. And as was known then, this was a decree of the Medes and of the Persians, and such law, such law never changed. The law carried, as all good laws do, a penalty provision. And the provision was that if anyone during this 30-day period violated the law, the king's decree, that they would be cast into the den of lions. It wasn't a den of lions. It was the den of lions. And so it was that the governors and the satraps conspired to do Daniel in. They got the king to sign the decree. No doubt Daniel knew of this decree. He no doubt learned of it. And can you imagine the conversation that took place, perhaps with his own conscience? It's only 30 days. No one will know whether 
I pray in private or not. I can close the windows. I'm 82 years old. Retirement is just around the corner. Just this once. Those were the thoughts that perhaps ran through Daniel's mind. And no doubt friends and colleagues who loved Daniel like a brother spoke to him and encouraged him to take the easy way out. Save yourself, Daniel. It's not worth the effort. Knowing of the law, Daniel retired to his home, went to the windows and threw them open, and it has had been his custom day after day, year after year, Three times that day he bowed towards the ancient city of Jerusalem, his homeland, where his family had come from. Nothing secretive about this man, nothing private about him. Open, in your face perhaps, but very much in public. Well, he apparently, as far as the governor's and the district leaders were concerned, fell nicely into their trap. O oh, King Darius, they quickly thronged about him again. This man, Daniel, this man that you would place next in command for the entire kingdom, has violated the decree of the Medes and the Persians. The king quickly caught on that he had been made the fool. He happened to respect Daniel. He wanted to save Daniel from this, what he now understood to be a terrible decree. I expect that he reached out to his attorney general and explained it to him and said, what can I do? How can I find an exception in the law? There must be an exemption for devout Jews who are in their 80s who have lived here for 60 years. Can't we do something? The Attorney General reminded King Darius that there was no way of changing the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And so the soldiers were sent. David was apprehended. He was brought before the king. The king explained what happened, apologized to Daniel no doubt asked for his forgiveness, but said, Daniel, I must put you in the lion's den. And so the officers took Daniel, placed him in the lion's den, and a great stone was rolled over the den, and the king's seal was put on that stone. We'll talk about the king and the opening of that stone in just a few moments. So we, as Adventists, are devout champions of religious freedom. Why do we champion religious freedom? Why is it so important? Well, let me suggest that there perhaps are at least three reasons. There may be many more, but let's talk about three this morning. We as a people understand that religion is vitally important. It answers those ultimate questions of life, who we are, where we are, where we are going, and why we are here. We understand too that the Bible is rich in examples of religious freedom. We think of Joshua, a military man, saying farewell to the children of Israel, and he brings them together, and he makes that offer to them, which is so remarkable that God would allow one of his leaders to make this offer. He said to them, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Amen. This freedom of choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Beautiful, that story in Joshua 24. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, please, eat of every other fruit and vegetable that you find in this garden, but do not eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. You know the story, the sad story, the tragic story, the story that really brings us together today is when Eve and then Adam took the fruit, exercised that freedom to choose that God gave them and ate of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. And think of how Christ himself in Matthew 22, uh, when given the coin and asked uh, to whom should we serve, to whom should we pay tax, and Christ showed that example, that separation of giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So we understand in theory that freedom of religion is important. But secondly, we also understand importantly that religious freedom in this country is a gift. It's something unique, it's something special. Do you realize that around the world there are literally millions and millions of Christians who are being persecuted because of their belief in Jesus Christ? Hundreds of millions of our fellow believers around the world are suffering persecution. In this country, we have laws that give us the right to exercise our religious uh, decisions regarding God. We have something called the First Amendment. It's in the US Constitution. The draft of that amendment was probably carried out by a young lawyer from the state of Virginia, James Madison. Uh, think well of James Madison. In 1787, representatives from the 13 states that had gained their independence from England uh, came to the city of Philadelphia. And they were to basically make improvements on the existing Articles of Confederation, which was then the government uh, of the then United States. But they got together and they realized that the Confederation was not doing the job. They needed something new. And so they hammered out over that long, hot summer in 1787 what became known as the United States Constitution. It was a great document as far as it went. But there were several states who said, look, the document does not go far enough. We need the protection for individual rights. And one of those individual rights was religious freedom. They told James Madison and other leaders who were trying to get this constitution adopted by the states, we will not agree to approve this new constitution unless you promise us that you will introduce a Bill of Rights. Madison and others agreed. The Constitution was adopted. And Madison himself went to the first Congress and introduced 12 amendments that were eventually combined and reduced to the 10, the Bill of Rights. And listen to those 16 words that are in the First Amendment. Not in the Fifth Amendment or the Tenth Amendment, but the very First Amendment. 16 words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And there it is, the establishment clause, the free exercise clause. These two pillars are the laws of this land and they protect each of us in this room. We can embrace them we can stand up and know that this government, according to the laws of the land, cannot deprive us of our right to come to church on Sabbath and worship Jesus in this beautiful room. Nor can the state create a religion, a religion that we must all obey with the threat of arrest or persecution or of our good friend Daniel of being put into a lion's den. So we understand philosophically the importance of the free exercise of religion and the importance of religion. We understand that it's a legal right that we enjoy here in this country, even though people around the world do not enjoy that same right. 
but we also understand from a personal perspective that there will come a time when we as Seventh-day Adventists will be denied the right of the free exercise of religion in this great land. And so we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, but because of that reality, that we face a time when we will be forced to attend church on Sunday or not at all, that we will not be permitted to worship on Sabbaths or not at all, we value religious freedom because we recognize that it is a gift, that it is precious, and that we embrace that gift and can do all we can to make that gift available for others. We also uh, have come to a point in our lives uh, as advocates of religious freedom where we recognize that this is a gift that we must become advocates for and champions of. I'm reminded of the words of the German pastor who took on Adolf Hitler during World War II. And he had these words to say, and this explains, I think, a lot in terms of our approach to religious freedom and why we are such staunch advocates. He said uh, that first they came for the communists. Now he's talking about the Nazis in Germany. And I did not speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I said nothing because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not say anything because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Catholics, and I did not speak up because I wasn't a Catholic, I was Protestant. And then they came for me, and then they came for me. And by then, no one was left to speak up. So today, when we see that Muslims are banned from entry to the United States, we can understand and champion the religious freedom of such persons. We understand national security, we understand safe neighborhoods, but we must be concerned and deeply wary when our government starts to exclude people from this great land because of their religious beliefs. So as a congressman said this past week, well, if we start banning the Muslims, can we then start banning the Seventh-day Adventists? So, spoken by a congressman from Minnesota, uh, critical of the a decision to ban Muslims, but nevertheless, an example of what can happen um, and why we must be staunch advocates of religious freedom, even though sometimes we find ourselves championing uh, those who perhaps are not as attractive and not mainstream in terms of their religious beliefs and practices. Well, what does religious freedom look like to us in the United States today? Let me give you three brief samples, overviews, if you will. There are lion's dens uh, here in our country. They may not have roaring lions, uh, but they can be just as fearful, just as deadly, and just as uh, damaging. Let me tell you briefly of the story of a young woman in Florida. Her name was Paula Hobby. She converted to Adventism and had a fine job in a jewelry store there uh, in Florida. But because she refused to work on Sabbath, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, she lost her job. She was unemployed. She had a family to support. Understandably, she went to the state of Florida and said, I would like to apply for unemployment compensation. The state of Florida said, no, thank you. You converted to Adventism. You chose to change your faith. We're not going to pay you any unemployment compensation. So think of that. The state of Florida, the government, these governors, if you will, conspiring to punish someone because of their religious beliefs. 
The church was able to help Paula Hobby. We appealed the case to the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Nine justices uh, heard arguments from the state of Florida as well as on behalf of Paula Hobby. I don't know how many lions there were in the den that Daniel was placed in, but some could say that the Supreme Court, at least at that time, was composed of nine lions uh, all ready to, uh, to consume uh, Paula Hobby and her attorneys. Uh, much effort went into preparing for that case, but the good news is that God moved on that court, and in a ruling uh, eight to one in Paula Hobby's favor, uh, her unemployment compensation was restored, and God gave her the victory. A second image of religious freedom in this great land, uh, it comes to us from the northeastern uh, state of Kentucky, a small, obscure county. And it presents a somewhat troubling issue, one that I would like you to think about. The Supreme Court had ruled earlier that year that there was a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And there was a clerk in this small county in eastern Kentucky by the name of Kim Davis who refused to issue marriage licenses to any same-sex couples that came into her office. She did so because of her religious beliefs, deeply held. No one doubted her sincerity, but she declined and refused to issue marriage licenses. She was taken to court. She was found in contempt of court and spent time in jail because of her religious convictions. Another sad aspect of this story is the fact that Kim Davis was kind of frumpy looking. You know, a lot of us are frumpy looking. Uh, long, unkempt hair, unstylish clothes, uh, easily stereotyped, easily mocked and made fun of. And so our secular culture picked on Kim Davis, and because of her religious beliefs, mocked her and made fun of her. A sad commentary on the state of religious freedom here in this great land. You can argue the legal propriety of the position that she took, but nevertheless, I think it is a reality that one of the enemies today is not of religious freedom is not necessarily the government, uh, but rather the secular society in which we live and how the culture is changing and the values that we have always held so strongly to are being eroded and are being destroyed and certainly laid aside. So pray for Kim Davis and uh, people who, because of conscience, make decisions that sometimes run counter to the law and certainly run counter to our culture. And finally, in terms of the state of the free exercise of religion in America today, uh, think of Ellen White and the book Great Controversy. And remember that two-horned beast that we find in the book of Revelation in chapter 13. And those who understand prophecy say that that two-horned beast is the United States of America. And while once, and perhaps even today, it is a staunch champion of religious freedom and of individual rights, there will come a time when it will become a persecuting beast and will take away those freedoms. Let me share with you, Mrs. White, what she says in the book, The Great Controversy at page 592. And listen to the words, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. 
Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced as obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will, be accused, uh, they will be accused of disaffection towards the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law regarding Sabbath observance will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. A cloud, perhaps, on the horizon. Much to be grateful for in terms of this land of the free and the home of the brave. But Mrs. White suggests that religious freedom that we enjoy today is and will be at one point in time in jeopardy. How will those circumstances arise when these grand protections contained in the religion clauses of the First Amendment are ignored or set aside or misunderstood or misinterpreted? I don't know what those circumstances will be. Perhaps another terror attack, perhaps a, an atomic bomb uh, here in the United States, uh, perhaps a new president of the United States, that, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm merely saying that uh, the future is in God's hand. We have much to be grateful for today, but remember that this gift of the free exercise of religion is one that uh, may be taken from us. And so we return to our good friend Daniel, and you'll remember that we left him in the lion's den. King Darius went to his chamber that evening, could not sleep, did not engage in the normal entertainment that the king enjoys apparently and the Medes and the Persians. Uh, there was no music. He got little sleep that night. He paced back and forth. On his mind was his good friend Daniel. And early the next morning, Darius, the king of the Medes and the Persians, gets out of his royal chambers and goes to the lion's den. And I told you what an interesting word when the enemies of Daniel were about the king's throne. They thronged, they thronged. And listen to this interesting word. And when he came to the den, King Darius cried, he cried out with a lamenting, a lamenting voice. Sadness, fear, perhaps a tinge of hope, but it was a conviction, no doubt, that his good friend Daniel was gone. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. Silence, pause, and then from the den, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths Amen. so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him, before God, and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. The 120 satraps, the two remaining governors, were gathered up, their families, their wives, and their children, and they were cast into that den of lions. The Bible tells us that even before they hit the bottom of the den, the lions had attacked and snapped them uh, to their deaths. Darius put out a tribute to Daniel's God that was spread throughout the land. The reality of the world that we live in today is that God loves each of us. He has blessed America in a very unique and special way. He has given us something that many countries do not enjoy, and that is the gift of religious freedom. And so it is altogether fitting and appropriate that we as Adventists are champions 
of religious freedom and of religious liberty. The reality of our lives saw that many of us will find ourselves in a den of lions. By our convictions, by our reputations, by the fact that we serve a living God and serve that God with integrity, we will be punished because of our witness. And there will be times when we will be blessed of God and we will be freed from the threatened punishment of whether it's a boss or the government or perhaps even a family member. There are other times when maybe we will suffer and our lives will not necessarily be exactly as Daniel. But we know that we serve a living God, a living God that is at work in our lives and in this world, and that there will come a day of judgment when we will be made whole and when God's truth will rule and rule and rule. So this morning, in closing, I would say to you that God has given each of you the wonderful gift the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose. Now, some may take that gift and that opportunity and reject God, but it's my prayer for each of you that you will accept the gift of choice, that you will choose God as your personal savior, that you will love him, that you will serve him, and that when he returns in the clouds of glory, very soon that you will be ready to go home with him and to live with him forever and ever. That is my prayer for you this morning. Um, this afternoon, I uh, have a very important video that involves the persecution of Christians uh, around the world. I think you ought to see it. You ought to be informed. Uh, we're also going to have a question and answer time period. So if there is an issue that is on your heart that you would like to speak to me about, we will uh, have an opportunity to do that in the, in the field of uh, religious freedom. Um, and also, uh, I have uh, some uh, summary of some of the big news, the big religious freedom uh, uh, issues of 2016 and what we might expect in terms of uh, religious issues, uh, religious freedom issues in 2017. And we'll talk about our new president, and we'll talk about his newly appointed uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, but we'll have a good time together, and we'll have a chance to dialogue and to visit about these important issues. Uh, Pastor uh, Bill Jones, uh, members of the Fredericksburg congregation, uh, it's been our pleasure and delight to be with you this morning. Uh, God's richest blessings to, uh, to you all. Thank you. All right, let's all stand and sing our closing hymn. And if I recall correctly, I think it's 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. Yeah.
Christians we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thrones have perished, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can Christ, O promise, cannot, can be failed. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on before. Onward, then ye Once again, we are grateful to you for all your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the gift that you gave us by giving us the power to choose. And thank you, Lord, for sending your message today through the lips of Wally Carson. We pray, Lord, that you may bless him, continue to bless him and his family, continue to bless his work as he works for you until Jesus comes. And so, Father, be with us as we go to our different places, and we pray in a special way, Father, for the food that we're about to receive. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. And now, uh, if you do have anything you'd like to have prayer with, uh, there's an elder at the front on the organ side. And have a happy Sabbath. <laughs> 